the Merseyside Maritime Museum, situated in Liverpool's wonderful Albert Dock, there's an amazing display of silver. Known as the Ismay Testimonial Silver, it was presented to Thomas Ismay of the White Star Line in 1885. Its centrepiece features a globe surrounded by four figures representing the maritime world. Representing the ancient world is Jason of Jason and the Argonauts. Then comes Columbus, the misguided soul who bumped into the Americas in the belief he'd reached the Orient. Then Magellan, whose ship was the first known one to circumnavigate the globe, though it arrived on without him, he being killed in the Far East. And lastly, Captain James Cook, Great Britain's preeminent 18th century navigator. The figurine of Cook is taken from the famous portrait of him by Nathaniel Dance. Well, it's not surprising that Cook should be so represented. He was famous across the Western world during his own lifetime, and there's barely a month goes by without his name still appearing in the media, especially at this moment, as we're in the course of celebrating the 250th anniversary of his voyages. He was noted as a straightforward, down-to-earth chap, with little humour, but he is a good role model for anyone, having risen from being just the son of a farm labourer to lasting fame through his own efforts. Sailing with Cook on his first voyage of exploration to the Pacific Ocean that departed from Plymouth on the 25th of August 1768 was a young man that we believe came from near Liverpool who held an important position aboard the ship. He was Endeavour's sailing master, the most senior non-commissioned officer. And that sailing master was one Robert Molyneux. And here's the only known image of him, which I'll try and make more human and animate. It's believed that he came from Hale Village, nine miles from the centre of Liverpool. It's a small, quiet place that I think Molyneux would still be able to recognise parts of, having the feeling of a less modern world. Now, we don't know much about Molyneux. We know that he spelt his name either with an I or a Y at different times. And we do know that he had a sister, Ellen, who was living in Liverpool in 1768, because he left his worldly goods to her in his will dated 18th of July. 1768, just before the Endeavour left Deptford on the Thames for Plymouth. What else do we know about his family? Sadly, not a lot. Over the years, the Captain Cook Society has researched every member of Cook's crews, and although we've had a lot of success, Molyneux eludes us. The ship's muster roll tells us he was from Hale, and we presume that that is the village near Liverpool because of his sister's residence in the city later. Although, it has to be said, there is another Hale, 20 miles away near Manchester. He was 22 years old at the start of the voyage, and we know he'd been paid off from the frigate Dolphin just two months before appointment to Endeavour. His experiences on Dolphin was important for this Endeavour voyage, as you'll see. As to his forebears, the name Molyneux was quite common in Lancashire. It was the family name of the Earls of Sefton, for instance, so that doesn't really help. Liverpool, in the second half of the 18th century, was already a most important and expanding port. The world's first commercial wet dock opened here in 1716. It now lies under Liverpool One Shopping Centre. And Molyneux may well have begun his maritime career on one of the many hundreds of merchant ships entering or leaving the Mersey. If he didn't sign on directly with the Royal Navy, he may well have been pressed from a merchantman. But let's look at Molyneux's role a sailing master of the Endeavour. The sailing master of a Royal Navy ship held a warrant after examination by Trinity House, an organisation that still exists, of course, and he was allowed to take charge as master of any of His Majesty's ships. Now, a master's responsibility was very extensive. Navigation, pilotage, and general management of the masts, yards, and rigging. Here's a quote for you. It will be an unwise captain who ignored or overrode his subordinate's particular expertness. And a second one. The value of a good master was beyond computation in gold or rubies. But there's a problem here for Molyneux in the form of his captain. Until being commissioned as a lieutenant so that he could command this voyage, James Cook has been probably the best sailing master in the Royal Navy. Cook had very extensive experience and was already noted for his abilities and his chart-making. He was also something of a control freak. The question is, 
would he let Molyneux do the job he was given without interference? Now there's another twist to this story. I've already mentioned that Molyneux had served aboard HMS Dolphin. Well, that frigate had arrived back in England just two months before Endeavour set off, after a two-year voyage that had circumnavigated the globe. She'd crossed the Pacific and is believed to have been the first European ship to visit Tahiti, where Endeavour is now bound. Molyneux had been master's mate on Dolphin under Captain Wallace, but it wasn't just he that had served on that voyage. Cook's first lieutenant, John Gore, had been aboard, plus four others of the crew. In some ways, Cook was one of the new boys here. He'd never sailed the Pacific, never crossed into the Southern Hemisphere. The fact that Molyneux was master's mate on Dolphin would indicate that he'd been in the Navy prior to 1766, when the Dolphin set sail. He would have first been an able seaman, before being promoted to master's mate, and he must have shown some ability to then be promoted to master. On the 17th of June, 1768, Molyneux joined Endeavour at Deptford on the Thames, meets Cook, and is immediately thrown into the work of refitting the ship for her new voyage. Two months later, the ship is in Portsmouth. It's August 1768, and in Portsmouth Harbour, the anchor is weighed, and they're off on their momentous adventure. Only to be delayed for two more days due to bad weather, such is life at sea. It's a good indication of the speed of Endeavour, or rather lack of speed, that it took them two months before they even crossed the equator. But on the 27th of October, Cook notes in his journal that the ceremony on this occasion practised by all nations was not omitted. No mention of King Neptune and his wife coming aboard, as in this illustration, but everyone that could not prove upon a sea chart that he'd crossed the line was either to pay a bottle of rum or ducked in the sea which former case was the fate of the greatest part on board. Cook himself had not crossed the equator before, so he and the onboard scientists and artists and a good number of the crew all paid their bottle of rum. Molyneux wrote, At four, hove the ship to, and the yard rope being reeved, ducked twenty-two people, who behaved with great spirit and gave universal satisfaction. The evening was spent without debauch. Now, I calculate that taking out the men who'd already crossed the equator before, and taking off the 22 who were ducked, there were between 40 and 50 men who had to pay their bottle of rum. So, in excess of 40 pints of rum were added to the crew's standard gallon of beer or wine per day, and yet, the evening was spent without debauch. Rather surprising, because sailors were not known for their abstinence when liquor was available. Incidentally, while heading down the Atlantic to the equator, a call was made at Madeira, where Cook brought a little extra wine to top up their supply. Over 3,000 gallons worth was bought on board. Now drink was both a curse and a blessing in the Royal Navy of the day. A curse because, as Admiral Lord Keith wrote a few years after the period we're now talking about, almost every crime aboard ship originates in drunkenness, so that a large proportion of the men who are maimed and disabled, are so from accidents that happen from the same vice. Yet in order to keep sailors who are cooped up on board ship for months or even years at a time happy, and be prepared to hazard themselves by climbing masts and yards in all weathers, it was booze that kept them happy and dulled the senses. Now as they continued south, Cook wrote, My crew seems very healthy and they are extremely productive. There are occasional outbursts of rowdiness and drunken behaviour. However, the worst offender is Robert Molyneux. His drunkenness is reprehensible. I must constantly put him to task to keep him off the bottle. Even so, I know he slips drinks in during work. Well, besides creating charts, it was part of a master's job to provide diagrams with his log to illustrate the written detail. And here's Molyneux's illustration of the harbour of Rio de Janeiro, with depths sounded and also showing where they anchored. North is actually to the bottom on this chart. All good work, despite his supposed drunkenness. When Endeavour then passed into the Pacific, Molyneux also included plans of coral atolls and even sketches of some islands. At the bottom of this one is a low atoll, and at the top, volcanic Osnaburg Island, now called 
Maheti A. He is an aerial photo. And then they were off to Tahiti and Matavai Bay and Point Venus, where they watched the transit of Venus. Now, remember, Molyneux and a few others had been to Tahiti before. They were able to communicate a little with the islanders, and it was to them a paradise island. It was a lovely climate, there was fresh food aplenty, and, most importantly for these young men, the island girls would give their company, and I use that word very loosely, for the price of an iron nail. Now on Endeavour, Molyneux recognised the woman who'd been thought to have been the Queen of Tahiti when the dolphin visited the island, Purea or Oberea. She wasn't the Queen and had been almost dispossessed during a recent civil war. However, she was the wife of an important chief. Well, Molyneux introduced her to his captain and she proved to be of use in negotiations with the Tahitians. And in the main, things went well on Tahiti. There were a few unfortunate instances, minor theft. Then one sailor, one Henry Jeffs, insulted a married woman and was given twelve lashes. But on the 7th of May, Molyneux notes an incident that Cook omits from his journal. This day, I acquainted the captain with some mutinous words spoken by some of the people. The fact being proved, the captain was going to proceed to punish the delinquents. I interposed, and a pardon was granted on promise of better behaviour in the future. I had many reasons for doing this, as I well knew the spring that caused these commotions. Well, we don't really know what this was all about, but it does show that the relationship between captain and crew was not quite as clear-cut as Cook made it seem, and that discipline was on the verge of breaking down on occasion. Another interesting point in Molyneux's journal comes in his entry for the 14th of May, a Sunday. He writes, One of the ship's tents being decently fitted for the occasion, divine service was performed by Mr. Monkhouse, the surgeon. He goes on to say that many of the principal natives were invited, and they recognised that the sailors were worshipping God. They too had a single God called the Atwa. But what is noticeable is that Cook didn't conduct the service. In fact, he rarely refers to God in his own journals and appears to have been agnostic. He had had exposure to Quakers in his younger days, but I'm not aware of any evidence that he actually became one. By October 1769, New Zealand was reached. Dutch explorer Abel Tasman became the first European to sight New Zealand in 1642, but he thought it was part of a great southern continent. Now Cook would circumnavigate both islands and produce the first usable chart of the country. So, how's Molyneux doing so far? Well, Cook might be disturbed at his drinking, but there's no indication that he isn't doing his job adequately at least. Molyneux made charts of much of New Zealand as well as Cook, and here's one which shows a harbour named Molyneux Harbour. Inevitably, they came in contact with the Maori. On the morning of the 10th of October, Molyneux wrote, the moment the first party landed, the natives now formed into a close body upon the bank of the river, set up a war dance, by no means unpleasing to spectators at a distance. Well, he might well say that because he remained on board Endeavour. They seemed to form in ranks. Each man jumped with a swinging motion at the same instant of time to the right and left alternatively, accommodating a war song in very just time to each motion. It's actually his description of the hacker. Well, after landing in Australia, surviving a near shipwreck on the Great Barrier Reef, and then claiming the east coast of the country for Great Britain, of course an act that is now considered contentious by some, but standard practice in Cook's day, Endeavour passed on to the Dutch settlement of Batavia, now Jakarta, for overhaul and resupply before heading home. Now, Batavia was a very unhealthy place, and for that, see my short film, the Bad Atmosphere of Batavia, also here on YouTube. Leaving that place on the 26th of December 1770, Endeavour crossed the Indian Ocean to Cape Town, the ship's log showing a sad litany of burials at sea. But as they left Cape Town on the 16th of April 1771, comes the following entry. Tuesday, April 16th, at 3pm weighed, with a light breeze at southeast and put to sea. At four, departed this life Mr. Robert Molyneux, master.
a young man of good parts, but had unfortunately given himself up to extravagancy and intemperance, which brought on disorders that put a period to his life. Under Cook's command, I'm sure he was a high taskmaster who expected the most out of his subordinates, I think Molyneux may have had a very hard time trying to do his job. It was certainly a difficult voyage. But whether he fully deserved the entry written by Cook, we'll never know. And in fact, it might actually tell us more about Cook than it does about Molyneux. His death occurred months after Batavia, and whilst his system may have been weakened by his time there, Cook's comment might indicate that he died from alcoholic poison or liver failure. But there, in Table Bay, he was sewn into a hammock with two round shot at his feet and sent down to Davy Jones' locker. He was just 25 years old and hadn't quite completed his second circumnavigation of the world. His will was proved in London on the 7th of July and his sister in Liverpool received the entirety of his estate, possibly two to three hundred pounds, which would have been a fair sum in those days, consisting, of course, mainly of his naval back pay. Cook would go on to two further voyages of exploration and see his fame rise across Europe before dying at the hands of Hawaiian natives in Kialakakua Bay on the Big Island on the 14th of February 1779. But neither he nor Robert Molyneux have a grave. A sailor's life is a merry life They rob young 